New Year, everyone. 2020, here we are. Uh, Ms. Uh, Johns, roll call, please. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Hoax? Here. Mr. Massey? Here. Ms. Burnett? Here. Mr. Rolfson? Here. Mr. Tucker? Here. Mr. Crail? Here. Ms. Style? Here. Thank you. Um, we have two presentations tonight. The first one is from the Mount Dora Friends of the Environment. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we're very excited to have the Friends of the Environment. Um, they've been a, a partner with the city, I think, in, in very good standing for many years, but especially in the last couple of years, we have really uh, planted quite a few trees. So um, I'd like to reach out to the board and ask that they come up and speak um, in reference to their donation. And I'm not sure who all they wish to, to come forward, but please do so. Will each of you introduce yourself and your position with the Friends of the Environment Council <coughs> put on the record? Donna Shelley, President. Andrea Buryancic, Treasurer. All in order, I'm just part of the tree team. <laughs> just break it. I, I will mention that we have part of our city tree team with us also and um, these are folks that have worked with us on a daily basis to make things happen and those things include getting trees into the ground so thank you so much both of you Jason and, and Robert we couldn't do it without them and so we're really excited for Donna to make this presentation for a number of years, one of the problems we've always had is getting water on the trees. And we got a little sick and tired of carrying five gallon buckets around, and the poor guys didn't have the equipment to do that on a regular basis. So we decided we'd get somebody to volunteer and give us some money, and we did, um, that we would buy something for the city and start a volunteer program to keep the load off of the regular staff and you know do it or go out and water these trees ourselves so this is what we had planned in 2020 we've got it done well we haven't we're working on the project we're working on the volunteers <laughs> yes yes <laughs> the we paper have the process <laughs> we finish up yes but um, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to do this I know everybody probably saw it as you came in because it's parked outside um, and it's beautiful and and I know we've already taken some pictures were you able to get some pictures as they came in because I'm trying to decide logistically whether to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know some people. to go out to it or whether we think we've kind of got it covered and then how do y'all feel? Has everybody had their picture taken with it? Good, Mr. is everybody? Mail, Mr. Nancy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, she's if you haven't had your picture, maybe let's take a quick second and run out. But, there uh, that's what yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you for an executive decision over here. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work when you. So why don't we take a few minutes and go out there and everybody who wants to be in the picture, let's get a picture. Can I ask a question first? Mm -hmm. If you need more volunteers, who should people contact? <coughs> uh, um, I so, guess I, I, it's not ready for that yet. Yeah. yeah so okay. yeah, okay. we're not to that point. We have to accept the asset. We still have to go through the process of the liability, city employees operating the equipment, and then um, how we're going to work um, with the friends of the environment on any of that. So I, I think we can come back to you probably next month. Um, I think we can get the asset accepted this month and go through that process. It'll be a formal uh, acceptance through mid-year of the asset dollar amount and so forth, and I'm okay with that. If council, I think you're fine with that. But we do need to work out the fine-tune the um, all the paperwork and liability insurance and so forth. Yeah, so. Okay, let's adjourn for five minutes and go out there and get pictures, and then we'll come back in and start our meeting, because our meeting is not a heavy, heavy meeting tonight. Again, we're, well, they're still outside. Well, this is monumental, and it really is exciting. I know that I've heard talk for a number of years about what it takes to get the trees planted and then keep them watered, and then when you see one that doesn't look too good, you feel sad because you wonder, was it because? Now, once we get all the paperwork done, and we get our system in place and our um, volunteers in place uh, working with the um, uh, city, it looks like we would have a solution to maybe even looking at hanging plants or something <laughs> down the road. So, you know, we, did, we, had, work. we have had some passionate discussions with our <laughs> residents talking about 
what we need to do to improve the visual view. And even though I personally believe we've made a lot of progress, uh, we still have a, a lot of room to go because we have a beautiful downtown, but we have lots of areas to keep up. So I'm hoping that the fact that we have an a, a, um, apparatus that will help us do that, um, that uh, we'll make more progress. So thank you very much to the Friends of the Environment. Okay, yes. They're probably out, out cruising around town in their vehicle. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got Because they still are. Oh, there they are. I see. Donna. Okay, next on the agenda is the proclamation of recognition of Mabel Norris Reese on Sunday, January 12th. So, um, yes, thank you, Mayor Council. Sorry, no. um, sorry. Again, it was requested by. It's it's not... Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, again, thank you, Council Members and Mayor. Um, it was requested several weeks ago um, of a citizen to consider a date uh, certain of the 12th of January as recognition for um, Mabel Norris Reese. Um, we put together a proclamation. Uh, the mayor has reviewed it. The um, staff, uh, Misty uh, Summers, actually went through and did a lot of research to make sure we represented um, as best we could um, a generalization of um, the things that uh, she represents, and I think we've got a pretty good feel for that in Mayor, would yeah, you let Thank you. Again? Yes, I think um, she did an excellent job. Uh, whereas Mabel Norris Reese was editor and owner of the Mount Dora Topic, who <coughs> earned widespread respect and national recognition through Gilbert King's books, Devil in the Grove and Beneath the Ruthless Sun. And whereas, when Reese writing about Lake County, she was a backer of the notorious racist sheriff Willis McCall, <coughs> and whereas, as time passed, Reese realized she had an unwitting accomplice in the reign of she had been an unwitting accomplice in the reign of terror. And whereas, when Reese began to write about McCall's misdeeds, she became a target who was terrorized, harassed, and forced to shut down her newspaper and flee town. Flee town. And whereas, despite these hardships, Reese stood up to the crooked and vicious sheriff and spent the remainder of her career dedicated to holding the corrupt sheriff, deputies, judges, and attorneys to task. And whereas Reese was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for her persistent attempts to gain justice, and whereas Reese, who was inducted into the Lake County Women's Hall of Fame in December of 2018, received awards for her articles she wrote on Martin Luther King, but always believed that her best and most meaningful work was done in Lake County. And whereas Mabel Norris Reese is being honored, not simply because she was an influential and great woman, but because she put her life on the line to stand up for what she believed in, and we are all the better because of her bravery, her perseverance, and her selflessness and sacrifice. And whereas the unveiling of the sculpted portrait of Mabel Norris Reese by artist Jim McNallis will take place on January 12th, 2020 at 3 p.m. Now therefore I, Catherine T. Hoax, Mayor of Mount Dora, have the distinct honor of proclaiming January 12, 2020 as Mabel Norris Reese Day throughout the city of Mount Dora and encourage all of its citizens to support the celebration and participate in the corresponding activities. Thank you. Art of our history. Okay, now we're at public comments, um, and I, I have to make a comment for those of you who read the um, packet. We are going to have these statements surrounding public comments rewritten. Um, I'm not comfortable with the verbiage, the way it's written. It's just a personal thing, but unfortunately, it takes a while to get it done because of the product, software product, and putting the work order in and the queue that we're in because it's been almost a month now and we're still in the queue. Yes. Um, I said to Miss Hayes, how much are we paying that? But anyway, it's another thing. Um, but with that said, we are at public hearing. I presently have three cards, and I'll use, do them in the order I receive them. And then if anyone else would like to come to the podium and discuss anything that is not on the agenda tonight. So the first one, Mason Allen. Yes, you get to go faith. first, Mason. Uh, Mason Allen, 1380 Lakeshore Drive. Um, 
I haven't been around here much lately, but I got a surprise when I came back from traveling involving the backflow project. And I have kind of was totally out of the loop on that. Okay. And being a commercial real estate owner, um, I was taken a little back by the uh, communication. And I don't know if how many of you have seen the letter that the uh, contractor sent out, uh, but I have several issues with it. Uh, one of which is this this project was signed up for in 318, I believe. And then uh, the sequence after that, it was uh, the, all the research on, on the properties were done by November 1st of last year. And then this document that came out is titled Inspection Noncompliance Number One. Now, this was printed December 13th. Um, just to in my business dealing, starting off a letter with uh, a headline that reads like that is probably less than and consumer friendly. And then it was not delivered. <clears throat> we don't know when it was mailed, but then my tenant received it by the 17th. Now, as you read further in the letter, it says this letter is entirely the responsibility of the owner. So I got it on December 30th. And the next issue then was that it says if it's not complied with by the 12th of January, my water would be shut off. So there's about a, I had about a six day window to resolve this on an issue that just seems like it's got a longer timeline uh, to inform somebody about. So I don't know if other people have had issue with it or not since I, although when I did call the company, she said I wasn't her first phone call. So I think that was maybe an indicator and I talked to some commercial owners who don't live here. Fortunately, I'm back and forth, and I mostly live here. And they are heard nothing about it because all the document, all those letters were written to the tenants, and the tenant has no obligation to pass it on to the owner. So uh, I would suggest that we have that kind of an issue that take the time to find out who the owners are. And um, the only other thing that troubled me about this whole event in talking to the vendor. Um, in another city where I'm involved, uh, they're dealing with the same thing, but their approach to it is not a universal application. And we seem to be on the avenue of universal application right now, except for residential properties. So they are actually appraising each property based on its needs. And I addressed that to the vendor, questioning, well, how did, how did that work in our case? And she said the reason, and I don't think she was quoting anybody in the city, but she did not say that. She said, we're doing it this way because your property may at some point be sold to a dentist who would then qualify to have this mechanism put on their property. So just in case you sell it to somebody who won't meet the guidelines, we're going to do it for everybody. So I don't know all the details that I, I haven't had time to look at the EPA information, but uh, just mainly to say if you're going to communicate with the citizens, don't turn the letter right. It, uh, the, on, in addition, the letter was not signed. There's no phone number on here from the city, nobody to contact. Uh, just says, call these other people now that we've sent you this letter. So I'm just saying, let's start the new year 2020 out with a little more thinking about the end user. I mean, that's kind of the way to look at the relationship. Unfortunately, from the time I got this, and I don't want to sound like I'm starting the year off on a negative, but because I hadn't been here, I had about eight utility bills that were very close to being due. And so I came down to drop them in our friendly drop box, and it was taped up. <clears throat> and it had been taped up other times when I've come, and I've never thought anything about it. So I took the time to go in and say, excuse me, but can you tell me why it's taped up? The explanation I got is, it's taped up so we can know when people who haven't paid their utility bills can't sneak their payment in before we have time to go turn off their water. <laughs> and I said, so me, the customer who pays their bills on time, has to come in and drop his so the city can go after people who haven't paid their bills because they try to put their payment in. And just another customer service that I would suggest maybe would be open to some review. Happy New Year. Good to have Ma you back. Mason, thank you. And I'm smiling because 
Ms. Hayes and I have already had that conversation I, because I got the copy from our condominium I'm association sure. and had pretty much the same discussion from our treasurer who did the timeline and gave me the whole thing and because by the time she got it we were like seven days or eight days from when it was due and there's no way in fact we've made the calls and we know what the queue is plus we got the whole list of people we so your points are well taken Ms. Hayes is aware of it and um, I believe she's looking at um, the details of it because even though this was discussed and I'm with you too the tone of the letter I, I felt like <laughs> Why do I want to cooperate? Oh, right. they're going to turn my water off. I yeah, guess I really. better. You know, but and my yeah, tenant, so. my tenant was in panic because I, appreciate I was it. gone. You yeah. know, so he's doing like. I appreciate you taking the time and come bring it to us, yeah. and so well, we can and further I, look at it. And I pretty much knew that was the case because when I called her and I said I need more time, she said no problem. Take till the end. That's of right. You're ready. Oh, okay. End of story. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mason. Mayor, may I have one yes, comment? please. Thank you. Uh, uh, I certainly understand that. I too got that on behalf of the country club of Montora. Uh, we had some issues with it, but I assured our manager that our that our city manager is well on top of that. It isn't going to let six-day issues like that uh, punish anybody under your circumstances. So I'm assuming your comments to us are heard and there will be a proper response. Thank you very much. Anyone else have here for any comments? Okay. Um, Marsha, Blum, speed bumps. Good evening and happy new year to all of you. As you may know, um, Hilltop used to have speed bumps on it. Uh, one set between uh, Overlook and Summit and the other between Summit and 11th Avenue. And the initial reaction of the residents was they didn't like it. And I'm sure the speeders also didn't like it. But <laughs> After a while, the simple question I asked many of them was, were they effective? And the answer was always yes. Well, near Christmas, they were removed. And I admit that I miss them. And so do a lot of other people on the street. And I, uh, what would seem to happen is this built up energy in the right foot of some of the speeders made it seem like they all of a sudden had steroids in their right foot because I, I don't mean to be funny about it but we some of the neighbors would be outside and I, I, I tell you that they some of the people were going 50 miles an hour up the street and we were all very frightened about that so as I said we, we did miss them so I'm here to ask about the future of the speed bumps or as I lovingly call them, speed stops, because they were the small ones, and I went over them at three miles an hour. But I'm not complaining about it because they were effective. Um, I know there are many traffic studies going on, and uh, maybe the city could save some money on Hilltop, because I can tell you that most of the residents really do miss them, and they all say they're very effective. Um, the only request we might make if they were to be returned is that we get the larger ones where you can go over at 20 miles an hour. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you, Marcia. Um, I keep doing that, sorry. Um, they were removed for our, our, our relays and for our marathons, um, and the intent was always that we would remove them for that, and then they would actually be placed back. Until the study is complete, um, we really don't want to put a larger speed bump or, you know, a three-inch or a... Um, uh, yeah, a table, uh, so to speak, because we don't know really what uh, what will come out of the study. So those will go back. They'll go in a similar location because it's already been identified from our, we have a team of uh, public works folks, uh, PD and um, our um, water supervisor, uh, Joe Grisakis. They go out there and they uh, analyze where the uh, position should be. So they'll go back to a similar location and they'll be replaced in that similar location as soon as they have the chance to do that. So, But they were trying to wait till we got through all the marathons or yeah. relays or that type thing. Yeah, I knew why they were moving. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But they are going back. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Michael Salerno. Happy, New Happy New Year, everybody. Um, there's a saying, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And I think that's where I am right now, and I don't want to be having a little, be in that situation. So I'm going to bring something up that's been brought up before, because I just want to clarify something in my own mind. Uh, prior to you becoming mayor, 
I think the council was discussing off of Donnelly the limit apartments that were going to be proposed, limit street, limit avenue. And at that time, I brought up a concern, which I also brought up when you talk to cottages, about the road pattern and the traffic, and we had four different developments, Dora, um, Dora Landing, these apartments on limit, the Waterman expansion, and the fourth one, oh, the cottages. And I was offering the suggestion that you have to take a look at all of this to combined, because what's going to happen to the, the road patterns? And at that meeting, it was explained to me when they were talking about the apartments that we're going to have a, quote, traffic study done. And I remember at the time saying, so once you get the traffic study, what are you going to do with it? And it was explained to me at that meeting, if I understood it correctly, that if improvements needed to be made in the road pattern, it would be at the expense of the particular developer in question which caught me off guard because I was viewing this as four things happening, but as it was explained at that meeting, it would fall upon the fourth developer to bear the expense. And since then, I'm thinking it doesn't make sense. So I'm coming back to bring it up again because I'm just envisioning if you had a road study done and the person comes back and said, yeah, you're going to have to expand Donnelly to four lanes in each direction to adequately handle all of this. I'm being sarcastic, but what, are you going to evict homes that are along Donnelly? Are you going to take away property from the library? It just didn't make sense. <coughs> then last week, I had a discussion with Ms. Dial about this, and she said to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm under the wrong impression that I'm thinking that I, I left that meeting assuming that whenever you had a development come up, there's going to be a traffic study. And she explained to me that, no, that's not the case. Each one is handled separately, and that council would have to approve a study. And it sounded to me like the only traffic study that was going to get done was for this Donnelly and Limit area, not the cottages, not Waterman, not Dora Landing. That really confused me because now I was saying, well, how do you know who's the cause of the need for the expansion of the roads if you haven't had traffic studies for number one, two, and three? If Waterman could be the problem or the cottages could be the problem. And then at a more recent meeting when you were discussing the cottages, and it was the first of your two meetings when you discussed the cottages, you approved it. And you, uh, Mayor, respectfully said, this whole other issue of the road pattern is a very important topic. We have to have a separate discussion on it. And respectfully, I don't think it's a separate discussion. I think it's all one. Like, I don't know how you can be approving new construction without taking into consideration what's happening to the needs of the public with regard to the roads. And I'm just thoroughly confused as to what the protocol is for hypothetically, I know you've already approved cottages, but let's make believe cottages number two is coming to you tonight. So it's, I'm divorcing myself from the four that we're talking about. How do you know to approve or not approve cottages number two without knowing what your road patterns needs are. And uh, I'm just confused. But well, thank let, you very let much. Let me clarify one point, then okay. I'm going to pass it to Ms. Hayes. What I meant when I made my statement was we've already approved those others. Okay. So to me, after the fact, we need to look at the whole thing. So that's what I'm talking about because those decisions were already made, but we don't need to wait to the next one to do it. The whole traffic flow pattern study needs to be done. So that was what I intended. Okay. I called it a separate discussion because part of it is what all's included. We have some things, I remember correctly, budgeted for that study. So that's what I meant was okay. they've already been approved. We just don't, don't want to move forward and ignore that. We need to stop and do that. 
before, actually even almost before we approved another one, depending on what's in the queue, because I've got to be careful, because people have been working all along. But with right. that, I'll pass it to Ms. Hayes, and she'll clarify some more of it. Right. So we talked at the last meeting about the fact that we had a submittal for a full uh, a full board traffic study. We adjusted that to a traffic calming uh, review because, um, honestly, we looked at the different projects and we said, okay, if we bring on a new planner, we'll have that new planner be involved and they would actually look at some of the information. The cost of a full study, I think, 160 or 200,000. So we reduced that to the cop traffic calming and let's look at Clayton and, and Donnelly and Limit. I mean, we did specify some of the roads. So um, we did have a partial piece of that uh, funded now. We initially had the entire amount, but we had to reduce the budget uh, by some some thousand dollars, uh, so many thousands. So does the developer pay for the traffic study? So not that piece. That piece was the city. That was us doing a study, um, all holistic approach from the entire city. So we did not ask the developer to do that piece of it. I would actually probably prefer Vince to come up and talk about who is required because the developers do have requirements and even our city attorney may wish to make a comment on what is allowed to be denied by this board by someone who has met all the qualifications of a project um, and if they've had a study and the study reflects that it's within limits about us even being able to deny something even if there's a feel that um, there's more of an impact than what may be indicated because again uh, we have to go on the reports that are presented to us by certified professionals or by engineers or by that type of thing but I think Vince is the better one to answer that from that perspective because that's his world not Can my I world. Can I just ask a point follow-up? Why, why should the city pay for the expense of the traffic study if the developer or developers are necessitating the study? So the, the total study is for the total city. Again, he can explain to you why a developer does pay for their portion based on their community. So we do have that. So I think he needs to explain that. And I would give Dora Landing as one of the ex examples, correct? So come on up if you will, please. Thank you. Thank you. We're reaching out to our consultant, CPH, and, uh, and do a presentation to our planning commission, a traffic 101 and to maybe start on the basic of how our ordinances are, are set up. Uh, we have a traffic guideline for all developers and the rules that they follow and the ordinances and impact on the project. So we're gonna present that here shortly uh, to the Planning Commission, get them up to speed and then bring a short presentation, if you so wish, to, to the City Council. Part of the traffic analysis with each development is based on the criteria and impacts Commercial will have certain different types of impacts. Restaurants, apartments, houses all have different traffic patterns. The roads can handle so many cars and trucks and vehicles, a capacity level, and they're graded A through F, failing at an F. So we have standards and policies in our comp plan that balance, if you build a road to meet the level F, the road would be a 12 lane highway, cost billions of dollars, and and it's not efficient. So there are some balances in your comp plan and the land development code on how the developer approaches traffic impacts and what they're required, their impacts, their restaurant, their commercial, their apartments, solely on that road. So they don't have to, by our ordinances, look at the rest of the city. There are certain parameters that they have to look at. There's intersections that they scope through in the design of engineering of the traffic study. So there are some impacts, but uh, that holistic traffic study is not a requirement of the developer. They're just required for their impacts of producing on the, on the road. It is one of those situations, if you have a rural road like Timberwalk, although Round Lake is a busy road, they came in with their impacts and it was turning lanes. We talked about at that time, Round Lake Road is gonna be widened, but they weren't required to widen four lanes for the Timberlake. Their subdivision with the 376 units only triggered management of access roads. So the same kind of you know, development is looked at in fill and limit. As each one starts coming in, they'll have entitlements that they didn't have to make improvements at intersections or a ramp or something like that. But the one that came in last, if they trigger and their development has the capacity level, then they may have to, so yes. Um, it's one of those things as development starts coming in, it is 
it, it starts impacting further. And it isn't just the Mount Dora Road and Limit. We're dealing with people cutting through. You know, this is Eustis to Berries. The transportation system works, you know, a regional. You know, we have Lake County. We have people coming from Apopka. So their development's occurring. They're approving development. They come travel down our roads, and those are captured in those reports with each each time. So it is a tricky one. It's expensive. Um, do the city, if we do a study, we'll want to see what would be the cost. And some of these are going to be very, very expensive, and it's going to be a policy decision. Do you want to start widening the roads? What intersections? What tools? You've heard of complete streets. You know, it is cars, but we also want to talk about pedestrians, bicycles, all our other modes, roll that in as well uh, in that transportation mobility plan so we're not just always get away from cars, build our subdivisions, locate the land uses where people can walk downtown or bicycle, that, that kind of. So there's a lot, lot, lot goes into the, the feel of it. Uh, so as the developments are coming on limit, we are feeling the pressure of traffic, uh, but their requirements and impacts, and most of them are not triggering these improvements. There will be conditions that could, as the one comes in last, may have to put in those extra turning lanes. Uh, kind of a generic brand, but uh, uh, we will bring a study back, or a presentation, I call it a traffic 101, maybe help provide the guidelines of where the state roads are, local roads are, the federal roads, where our roads, and, and kind of how our rules work and our comp plan, and things like that. And then we also have the effect of like 441. We already know there are certain intersections limit and 441 will be expanded over time. It's already been presented to us by the MPO, by um, the state. So we do know that road will change and we know that that's already triggered from the 441 usage, not necessarily the, the, the limit usage, but we'll have to accommodate that down limit. So um, at this point we have not accepted limit as one of our streets, that's a county road at this point in time, so we'll have to work with the county on that also. So, I mean there are those exceptions. Yeah, yeah. And we're reviewing a project of it's coming in a subdivision and we're looking at their access management. Does it all go on limit? Does it separate to another side street? So those the, those kind of decisions are made um, as we're growing with these growing pains of, of traffic and balancing to have um, you know lifestyle issues of not sitting in traffic, and that's. So if I if I understood you, then Vince, you, we will be having a presentation in the future here to further um, explore all of this and put all the pieces together. Yes. Okay. I think that we. Anyone else up here have any comments at this point? Then we're looking forward to that, obviously, yes. because it, you know time is of the essence. We talked to CPH in November, was it about? We, we, well, actually, when cottages first came in last yes. April. Okay. So the traffic, uh, the, the gentleman was making those comments back at that time as well. So it just it's, it's the budget issue of trying to provide that a timing of a um, starter education. I, I'm asking because I, I don't know this, but I do recall when the group from the cottages came, they had a traffic engineer um, who had done, when we were talking about one entrance or two entrances and stuff like that. So what is the, if I'm a developer and I want to I want to build 27 houses or 400 apartments or whatever, what's, what are my obligations in terms of providing traffic data from a certified um, we have written guidelines, regulations on the impacts of that development. So the 27 units, their mathematical formulas of how many cars are triggered. Our code addresses access points on various roads. So those all come out of analysis of that study. In some subdivisions, like the cottages, they're de minimis. The traffic study says as much as it is in real world, you're, you, you won't have the impacts on the road. It won't congest the roads. This is the engineering numbers, so they're not required to. Fire ordinance, so that's the balance of our ordinances. If you require that, then you start widening these roads, you start putting all these massive infrastructure improvements in an urban setting, a two-lane road, and 
we got to be very careful of how we start making these improvements. So we have to look at it holistic. Is there other alternatives that these cars need to go? Are they cutting through? Why are they? Why is there congestion at the intersects and why? Is it a stop sign, stop signal? Is there other mechanisms we need to look at? So there are cases where the subdivisions, they won't trigger the impacts so of the capacity of the road on that little tiny, you know, street. So it's, it, it can't happen that way. So um, the traffic calming study citywide and I think you called out five or six different Clayton and some of the major arterial and, and, and you know whatever but um, each each potential developer has to bring uh, his or her own uh, data saying yes. my hundred new homes are gonna generate 400 trips a day, and since it's residential, mostly they'll be at set between 7 and 9 in the morning and a.m. and p.m. So on, which would be different if it was a restaurant or a, a, a retail. So, so it's a uh, it's a combination. Um, some of the uh, some of it we have to do, uh, but some of it is provided to us. And we know that that data is good. It just seems like yeah. the developer picks their traffic engineer. Wouldn't the traffic engineer say whatever that developer uh, wanted? Uh, no, not, not specifically, because the MPO provides traffic counts on roads and capacity of the roads, how many cars would be realistic. Again, in the grading of it, a realistic isn't an F, but a B and a C. Our comp plan actually sets some designation, some roads will have because of the design, they will be a higher capacity on that road, and that, and that capacity works into a mathematical formula. How many cars can be vehicles? Trips in the morning and trips in the evening for commuters. So that will be engineering. So they just don't willy-nilly make up the engineering data like mine can do. There is engineering there checks, criteria checks value. On yeah, on that, that. Okay. And then we send those reports, those engineering reports, out to our third-party traffic consultant. So they validate their report. And license. I mean, most of these people have a license, and they're regulated, as you would expect, by the state or whomever. And, and we, quite frankly, don't want to be responsible for someone's subdivision and what their requirements are. We want them to certify it and tell us this is what is going on, this is what the impacts are based on what the formulas are, because we would then be responsible for all of those different developments. We need to rely on the outside world to bring things to us because otherwise it's, it's ours and, and we don't want that responsibility in, in every respect. Got it. So just one more kind of question. Accountability. I um, so to Mr. Solano's um, question, uh, four developments are lined up. Um, development number one does its traffic, maybe along the same yeah. road. Um, development number one does their study and it comes back as, that'll be okay, we have the capacity for this development. <laughs> number two uh, comes along six months later and they have their traffic study, which includes everything that was in the last traffic study plus the homes or apartments or whatever in the last traffic study and then they, then so now maybe we're up to 85 percent of capacity and then the third one comes in and it's it's going to be a giant uh, development and that may be the thing that's now we're at 110 percent of capacity and, and, and in order for that to move ahead that developer has to mitigate yes. provide an extra this or that. We'll provide solutions or, or, or other alternative connection points. Get off that road and find another route so you're distributing your traffic flows. So those all, that would be on their dime. They would pay for those. And it doesn't blow back on developer number one right. who contributed to it and developer number Easiest two. Easiest said it is first in time, first in right. And, and I, I think probably to, to the last 
kind of point, at least at least what I heard, it, from a legal perspective, from the council, if you were to advise them, if if they've turned in all the reports, even if from a field perspective that it's overpowering the roads, if they've met all the requirements and it hasn't triggered. And we provide those reports to our outside consultant and we look at all of the things that we do look at. And we we can't deny someone because we have a an uncomfortable feeling. Uh -huh. Right. And and sort of the bigger city's policy is do you then widen that road and that isn't all the developers. Do you want to for economic development turn that into right. a boulevard fight add more capacity? Is there something that needs to be done on that segment as a city policy? Large cost. These are not cheap as you know. I mean, it's, it's so it's the, and, and we're downtown, you know, do we start it, it's 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 tricky to those kind of policy decisions. So, uh. what I would hope, and again, having not been part of that discussion, so maybe I just need to catch up. But I would hope that just because the discussion was had six or eight months ago when we were doing budget, and because we were trying to balance a budget, we decided to go with just the calming study versus the full fledged study. You know, maybe we need to rethink that now that it's really become a, a major concern of a lot of res residents and we've heard it and it's been repeated, I would rather be comfortable in knowing and understanding the differencing of them and then, you know, the cost difference, even though it may be more expensive, it may be the right time to do the largest. And I don't know, I'm just saying I don't want to just continue along the road we took um, now that we have other information and more um, and we can, uh, hit it, we can hit our comp plan, which is coming up as a policy, that by such and such year, right. the city shall develop a comprehensive, we can work budget-wise, strategic-wise, systematic-wise, uh, on these large dollar consultants of that kind, and put it in a comp plan as a policy, so then it's ratified that this is something we're interested in as a high priority. And we've already been thinking that in the comp plan that's coming Okay. As well as looking at that for mid-year, so that is something okay. we're looking at. The other thing we can do, too, um, again, I, I believe, and that's one of the questions to our city attorney, um, if you wish to um, uh, put a policy in place that establishes a limit or a, a range or something, this would be the time to do that in the comp plan. Uh, so I know there are also some state regulations, so I want to be cautious on how I ask that question. but. The policy could be at a city level versus a state level. Well, and that's why we look at the comp plan so often, and we look at our land development code to make sure that we are up with the times and the things, the developments that are changing. Um, so we will address things like that in our upcoming yeah, it's being comp plan review. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Balsam. Uh, just a side comment uh, to Mr. Salerno's credit. Uh, this has been an engaging and helpful three-minute comment, public comment. <laughs> so thank you. Any, anyone else? Okay, now, is anyone else who did not fill out a card <laughs> would like to come up and speak? Hi, Vance Yoakum. I write the blog, FiscalRangers.com. Uh, this uh, whole area of traffic is, because I go to a lot of cities, I go to most of the county board meetings, the school board meetings, and uh, I haven't seen a riot like I've seen at some other places yet here. Um, but you're, you're tilting towards it, I think, and I'd like to share some observations. Uh, I came here from Orange County, California uh, 12 years ago, and there everything is laid out in the grid. They have master plans, and they have, like, minimum three-lane highways every way. They, they did it right because it was orange groves there, too. But here you've got all the lakes, and this is kind of like essentially planting roads in the middle of England where you, they, all their roads fall at horse paths. And uh, the um, uh, traffic studies, I've come to the conclusion, because I've been at several city council meetings where these come up and the traffic engineer come, trots out and says, we got this study, and it says everything's okay and there's no traffic. Meanwhile, people, unlike another county road, Dead Island, Dead River Road, or Shirley Shores, which is over here off of Deer Island, they're stacked up, sometimes three lights to get through. They're raving angry, and uh, they show up and fill the room much bigger than this one. Um, and the, um, 
and my view is that I think that the methodology that's being used by these engineers is not appropriate or does not recognize perceived traffic loads by the residents. And I think you ought to seriously think about that because when they're talking about using, following these regulations and the planners have and everything else, I think there's something drastically wrong with it. Uh, I'm probably going to start reviewing those starting with the county and their methodology that they use because I think there's something wrong with the methodology and that you ought to challenge that rather than just accept it because they got an engineer that they trot out and says I'm following these standards that come from the state. Um, the, um, the, I would suggest that you compare traffic costs uh, for your intersections and everything among all the cities. I don't know if you even do that uh, So because you're talking about how much it costs to, to expand roads or to have a turn lane or to add a signal. And I know with state, road, state intersections, that's a big problem. But you just mentioned that you have an accepted limit. And one of the things I see is why are the cities annexing land and taking over and collecting the property taxes from one or both sides of a county road, but then they say, well, we're not going to accept it because it's not up to our standard. I think if you're going to accept the property taxes, I think you ought to accept the roads as is. Uh, it ought to be part of the deal. Um, and the, actually, the county is starting to look at that pretty seriously because they're getting hammered from everybody. Uh, and um, let's see. Uh, the, uh, it was mentioned about respond. The attorney mentioned the responsibility, and you didn't want the responsibility. But my view is, I think you ought to take accountability for maybe setting leadership for the road throughput and the traffic, and and minimizing traffic jams. And that may mean a whole new kind of workshop and thinking about the process because. This whole county is going through these kinds of things. The county board is getting slammed by people showing up and, uh, and raising heck. And then the cities point to the county, and the county points to the city, and they won't spend the money because it's, they're not collecting the taxes anymore. Uh, as part of it, it's a lower priority for them. So uh, I think there's a whole big area of traffic, and I think that you probably do, maybe you need I don't know if you need a traffic study where you throw money at a consultant. I think you ought to get somebody that just comes in as a project leader and goes through all this stuff and interviews people and comes up with something, somebody that you respect in the community or three people on a committee and have them come up with some solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Mason. I'm, I'm this. Cities represent, cities representatives of the Go ahead. Tell to the Tri-County tri Mason Allen, 1380 Lakeshore Drive. Thank you. I'm the city's representative to the Tri-County Transportation Advisory Committee. And I'm sure you're all aware of the roundabout that's coming in our neighborhood. However, and I haven't gotten to the bottom of it quite yet, but that was done before we knew the post office was moving. So when you talk about creating jams, uh, I live out in that end and my warehouse is there and I have properties near there. I think all these other roadblocks are going to be nothing compared to possibly. So just throw that out to you. That, that might need review. Thank you, Mason. That was a concern I had back when we found out where the post office was going because of a lot of our residents coming across town now. So, Mr. McKechnie. Thanks. Hello, Gary McKechnie, 2101 Arbor Way. I just wanted to take a, a quick moment and say thank you all uh, to City Council, uh, to Misty Summers, uh, who created the proclamation. I was, I, was that one of you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> very good. Yeah, that was very good, Misty. Um, anyway, I wanted to thank you so much for uh, creating that proclamation that will be presented on Sunday to, uh, during this event. So I really appreciate it. Thanks. You're very welcome. Very well. Thanks to you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else wish to speak? Okay, we'll move forward. We've got an agenda. I'll entertain a motion to accept the agenda unless someone would like to change anything. So moved. Second. Sir. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, we have no consent agenda. We have no 
action items or public hearings. So our first is a resolution. Resolution number 2019-140. Is it 2019? Yep. Yes. Okay. Dash 140. Construction ma oh that's right, because we started this back in September. That's right. Can much construction ramp manager at risk CMAR agreement. Ms. Devon. Resolution number 2019-140, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to construction manager at risk services for the city's fire stations and related adjoining facilities, <coughs> providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for approval of agreement and authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative action, providing a savings clause, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Excuse me. Um, Mayor, council members, uh, this particular item, um, there's really a team approach, um, as you're aware. So we have our fire chief, Tim Greiner, here, and the audience has been involved in this. We have Chet Kramer, who's our construction manager involved in this. We have Joe Grisakis, our utilities uh, director involved in this. Marilyn Douglas, our purchasing agent, has been involved in this. Tom Klinker, our finance director, has been involved in this. Um, but really, the... Um, uh, the workings of the agreement has been on our city attorney, um, so she spent a lot of hours working with them. Again, some direction. We've had a lot of meetings, a lot of team meetings on the expectations um, of the agreement. Um, I hope you all had time to review it today that since we sent the agreement out to you. Um, I, I think probably the best thing would be address your questions. Um, the, um, the CMAR agreement is our template going forward for all of our CMAR. <laughs> We do real recognize that this is a more in-depth one than someone asked me earlier, the style did about the pool. Will the pool follow this? Yes and no. Um, this is our template, So, but the pool is a much smaller project compared to this. So there are some things that may not be needed as part of that particular project, and then there may be additional <coughs> items. Um, but um, I think uh, kudos to, to our city attorney um, and, and Marilyn going through it, but also that team that I mentioned to you, I think without their uh, hours and dedication, we would not have been provide, to be able to provide this to you. Um, I will say that some of the um, uh, some of the items that we had to look at, um, we had to work with the contractor to find out. Um, a good example is um, overhead costs. Um, their overhead costs, as expected, would have been somewhere, I don't know, 15 or 18 percent. We proposed five initially, so um, we um, they come back and worked with us at seven. Uh, that's in there. So um, we really worked hard. We really did bring it in at a, at a lower level than what we knew that they would accept, um, because we also wanted to see what they were willing to give. Um, we also looked at other templates from, I don't know, seven or eight other cities and counties um, so that we could gather the best of all of them and push out the things that were not needed and maybe were a hindrance. So um, we would entertain any questions. I can go through it. You can ask your questions, whatever works for the council. I don't know much more than I can explain other than this is for all three stations. Um, it represents, um, as, as mentioned in here, 190, I want to give you the exact number, $199,594. Um, it represents $67,861.96 for one, $65,866 and two cents for a second one, and the same for the third one. Um, the difference is our administration building versus just two regular fire stations. Um, and then there's clauses in there to where if we have to bring you change orders as to what those would be would reflect. It'd be a certain percentage above direct cost or what it might be. Um, there's a lot of details in here and, and again I would be glad to go through those um, but we feel this is a, a good template and a good product that's taken us three months plus to get here. Okay. Discussion. Mr. Lawson. Uh, thank you Mayor and Council. Uh, I, I have some simple, one, one maybe simple question and then a comment. I was able to read or had the time to read through all of the previous draft that we were sent with the yellow lines or what we call red line, one that had uh, concerns or that were the subject of negotiations. And I'm assuming uh, that all of those were effectively resolved to your satisfaction, city, um, city attorney, and to the manager's satisfaction and to those team members' satisfaction. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. I, I, I totally support construction manager concepts for uh, projects of this huge amount. Uh, it's a heavy, heavy responsibility. I've been involved in them before in other 
past things in my life. And it's to me, it's the only way to go. There's so much issue and responsibility and so many tentacles out there that a professional construction manager, I, I see one of my colleagues nodding and imagine it's in a school issue, so I understand that for the same reasons. And um, it's just a wonderful way to go. And now that we've negotiated that, I, I've looked at things like hold harmless agreements and things like that that are very important to me, and those are resolved effectively, as, as I understand it from your comments, uh, Ms. Sutphin, so I totally support this, and all I needed to know is that those issues that were being negotiated have been resolved. Yes, sir. Thank you. As you can imagine, only an attorney could uh, get excited about uh, a 70-page contract. But uh, this thank one, you, thank you, Mr. Massey. This, this one is a this one is a thing of beauty. It truly is. Uh, if you are opposed to spending two, almost two hundred thousand dollars to have a professional manager run such a project of this scope, take the time to read this thing uh, in its entirety and understand how many moving pieces are at work here. And, and if you've ever remodeled a bathroom or remodeled a kitchen, I know that, that you had a plan when you started, and no matter what you did, managing it personally, all those decisions that come, problems in supply and delivery, problems in the labor force, availability, all that scheduling problem, all of that rests on the shoulders of our, uh, of our CMR in this circumstance. It, it's such a horrendous undertaking, undertaking. <laughs> And this is so well done, and, and I appreciate the work that has gone into this. It, it serves as a very, very good model. If you, if you, as a citizen, are concerned about this, read the aspects of this uh, contract together with understanding the scope of the problem, and you'll understand why it is, it is smart business practice to have a professional administrator assume the responsibility for bringing all this together. It's a, it's a marvelous project. Thank you for the work that the staff and the attorney have done to put this together to uh, lead the fleet, if you will, for us. Read all 64 pages, see what you think. Or whatever. Mr. Crail. Uh, well, I, I agree with my um, colleagues. Um, this is the best money <coughs> we could spend. $200,000 will save us millions of dollars in potential, as, as uh, was stated, do that bathroom project and it all looks pretty simple until they find out that the plumbing doesn't come in, so on and so forth, and, and um, it's for us an economy of scale. A big city, Chicago or Denver or New York, would have staff, architects and engineers and so on, who might do um, some of this work. Um, this is this is a big project. We have one chance to do it right. It will save us um, lots of money along the way, and, and I fully support it. And I, I think it it is uh, the the rates the seven percent. Those are those are very good numbers, and I, I appreciate the work. Not to mention potential this. liability savings. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was right. shocked over the seven percent. I'll say that first. Thing, I was expecting ten. Well, I think ten is a, yeah, kind of the standard. standard. Yeah. Kudos to you all who negotiated the agreement. Anyone else up here want to comment? Scott. Um, I just have a couple of questions, and uh, if my page numbers are off, it's because I read the first one. So, um, on page fifty-eight, which is section eighteen point sixteen. That's 58 of 70, not 58 of the packet. Oh, sorry, it's 57 now. But it goes into 58. The applicable licensing and compliance with all yeah. the laws? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I just wondered if, um, if our city attorney can give an example of some type of change to a law that would happen that would cause an adjustment of the time or cost of this project. It's very funny that you asked that because this was the I'm a last very funny person. You yeah, you you do have <laughs> funny traits. So this this was actually the last paragraph that we um, struggled with and how we were going to handle this. 
um, because everybody was saying, well, I don't know what could possibly happen. The most simplistic e example that I can give you is um, say that there's a particular notice sign that has to be put up at a, at a um, construction site. And it's a notice sign that the law changes um, the regulations. Um, like at one time, we did not used to have um, where electrical lines come down, you didn't used to have um, at a construction entrance the little flags that hang down, but you do now because somebody got into electrical lines when they were getting onto a construction site and it required them to be marked differently. So while we're in the middle of construction, if something changes that causes them to have to incur costs, then we're going to stop, we're going to look at that, we're going to see if that requires a change order, and if it does, how much are we willing to pay toward that versus how much the um, construction manager at risk is going to take on related to that issue. Okay. And, and the main thing there is, again, they may take that with them for their next job, but we're only getting the benefit of it at this job. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we're not paying forward for someone else um, from that perspective. Okay. And then in that same paragraph it says for each separate GMP, so is there more than one gross or is it broken out by fire? Is, does, it mean, does that mean by fire station? Yes, and in the GMP section it says that there may be more than one GMP because of the three different fire stations. We may have one. It really is just going to win. Everybody puts their heads together and they start, we have our architect on board and we have start having our meetings and we determine, okay, we're going to, they can price these in one lump and we can build them all at the same time simultaneously. That likely won't happen. We probably will need separate GMPs, but we have structured every part of this agreement so that we can address even liquidated damages for each separate GMP. Okay. Um, and then um, the part that talks about the um, city manager, of course, being able to approve things less than $35,000, I just wondered if things come up where, where a, an additional purchase needs to be made or uh, money spent, is it possible that the council could get an email just saying, you know, we had to spend $25,000 on for this project? I think that will be part of the construction management update each meeting. Okay. Um, so I think that's something we're going to know ahead of time. So we're not just going to arbitrarily go out there um, and spend. It's going to be within that approved budget that you've already approved. So um, I don't see, I mean, I'm going to have to come in and ask for a budget adjustment if I'm spending more than what's already approved. And, and I would bring that to you no matter what because you already exceed a project cost more of 35000 and from a, um, um, you know, combining projects, you, you're beyond that. So um, what we've done with some of the large projects in the past is that I would send out an email that said, okay, that you would allow that twenty five to go to two hundred, uh, as long as it's within the scope of everything that we've discussed so we can continue operating, <coughs> but that's just part of the normal already approved and that we would notice it. So again, I think we can do some kind of combination of notification through through Chet as he's giving you an update, but even a, an update from an email too can happen. Okay. And then um, on page 66, the worksheet that gives all their numbers, are those estimates and subject to change, or are those, like some of them are um, site visits or group meetings, but I didn't know if that was subject to change, because how long do you really know if the meeting's going to go type thing? Yeah, I think they are designed to be an estimate, Okay, but... Close enough. Yeah, we could have some savings. Okay. Um, I think I had one other thing. Oh, uh, and maybe you can't say this because we haven't started yet, but is it planned that any of our guys or equipment will be used for this, or all the equipment comes from their contractors and subcontractors? And it's contracted yes. out. That's why they're taking on the risk. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rolfson? Well, just if I might add one other thing in response to Ms. Stiles' very proper question. The first question, the legislature meets every year, and as the saying goes, uh, no person's life or property is safe when the legislature's <laughs> in session. And so that's one of the main reasons, in my view, why that's appropriate to consider. Uh, legislature thinks they can't pass ex post facto laws. They do, and unless it's challenged, uh, 
they pass things that will affect both in the past and in the future, uh, and uh, that's a very valid reason to have that provision in addition to what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here? Anyone from the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Back to council. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Crail? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Ms. Bartnett? Yes. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mayor Who? Yes. I'll have, I have one other thing to say about this, and I know Ms. Hayes and I discussed it, and so did Ms. Steppen. Um, I would prefer in the future that when we have something like this that we not get a uh, updated packet that we plan so that if we're not going to have it prepared in time that it goes to our next council meeting in fairness to everyone to have time to be able to go through it and also in fairness to our residents because our packet goes out and they don't always have access in fact very seldom have access to things we get today um, so and I know this wasn't necessarily an emergency it the the process was such that it had been so long people wanted to get it off the thing but for me, this is so important. It's a template. It's what we're going to be using for the future. And I, I believe by listening to the discussion, everyone is comfortable in, in having had a lot of reasonable time. But still, I would rather not see this happen. I really want us to go back to what we've discussed and what I think I discussed the first night I was here, is that our agenda packet goes out hopefully at 5 o'clock on um, Thursday afternoon and that there are no adjustments and that if for whatever reason people don't get in what needs to be unless it's an emergency it moves to the next agenda so that we have proper time and our residents have proper time for it so that's my only comment on this I mean fortunately like many of you I was able to read through it looked at all yellow lines and everything but that's not always the case and yet something this important I would have been very uncomfortable had that not happened myself personally so just my comment on that okay moving on Go to ordinances. It's the final reading of ordinance number 2019-21, annexation of the Bristol Lakes Phase 2 LLC, Ms. Stone. Ordinance number 2019-21, an ordinance of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the voluntary annexation of the property generally located at the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 441 and Bristol Lakes Road, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for voluntary annexation, providing for effect of annexation, providing an amendment to Chapter 2 Code of Ordinances, providing for filing requirements, <coughs> providing for implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for limited codification and Scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Yes, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Vince Sendersfeld will come up and uh, give you a, a, at least a, a summary of the final reading for the annexation of Bristol Lakes. Uh, 1.61 acres. Uh, this is eligible for the annexation. It's an enclave area and it'll be used as an access road for the adjacent property to the south, uh, which is contiguous in the city, uh, which is a R3 zone for apartment. So this is a continuation of a project development. It's eligible for annexation. Any Pieces. changes since the first reading? No changes in the ordinance, and it's been advertised before the statutes meeting our requirements. And can you tell the council, do you recall, Vince, um, just briefly, the PNZ uh, meeting vote? Um, I've had some people ask that question about, uh, was it a 7-0, a 6-1, do you recall? 7-0. I do not recall. There was no okay. dissension votes of city attorney. Uh, not That's on the item. I believe it was 7 0. <laughs> Chairperson wasn't here, is what I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? Anyone from the audience wish to discuss this? Back to council. I'll entertain a motion. I so move. I'm sorry. I'll second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Mayor Hoax? Yes. Okay. 
First reading of ordinance number 2020-01, change in zoning of Bristol Lakes Phase 2 LSC. Ordinance number 2020-01, an ordinance of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the zoning classification change for that property located at 19510 U.S. Highway 441, providing for legislative findings and intent providing for zoning district classification change, providing for modification of the official zoning map, providing for implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for non-codification and Scribner's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, a change in zoning, first reading, Vince Sandersfeld, our Planning and Development Director. Um, and Vince, those same similar questions if you, as you go through this, if you will, sir. And this was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission at the December 18th meeting. Uh, this is a rezoning for assignment of the <coughs> station. It's carrying kind of a holding zoning. It's a county agriculture. But actually, the land use is a regional office. Uh, it has a high intensity land use designation, so an R3 is an appropriate designation. When we do our map cleanup in the comp plan, we'll put a residential designation on it so things match appropriately. But for this purposes of the assignment of the uh, annexation, we're requesting the R3 multifamily, which is the adjacent districts. The Bristol Lake Apartments are R3, property south is R3, and this would be a compatible land uh, zoning district. Uh, matching this property and be appropriate designation per our comp plan and our land development code. It's 1.61 acres and it's located on our 441 corridor just at the Bristle Lake Apartments entrance. Small track. Okay. Anyone from the public wish to discuss this? Add any information? Back to council for discussion? I'll entertain a motion. I move it approved. Motion, and I have a second. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Rothson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Okay, now we're at discussion items. Did you have anything to bring up? We'll go to your report, Ms. Sonhays. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in the city manager report we have in there from our lobbyists, um, some just update on some of the legislative bills. I'm sure um, Council Member Rolfson may even mention some of those. Again, I would just uh, mention to you to read through those. Um, again, a lot of them have just been presented, and that's it. A lot of them have not been through the subcommittees or the committees um, and presented on to their next committee. Um, they go through a lot of uh, discussion in most cases. Um, the first two listed appropriations, um, those would be within their budgetary line item approved. So the first one is a Brit Road utility. That's really the um, the, the cleanup at uh, Lakes and Mount Dora and the Country Club, so it's really the connecting. Um, it's about 500000 give or take. We're not sure. We have kind of stated from the beginning three to 600000 um, They uh, when, when our lobbyists put it in, I think they put it at the, the, the uh, far end of our budget, which is good because that allowed us to be able to do a little more with it. But they could approve, uh, appropriate maybe as little as three and some change. Again, that would really go a long way for us. The second one is the one that we um, have also been, we were very surprised by um, the doctor, or excuse me, um, Ms. Sullivan's office reached out for House Bill 4083. Um, that's the EOC Center. Um, we I believe it's about a million dollars. Is that correct? What was it, Steve? It's 300,000. Sorry. Okay. It was 300,000. For emergency, I had it down as a million, so thank you for correcting me. Um, going toward our um, EOC center and our public works facility, so that would reduce the cost of that building by that 300000 so it reduces the cost to our citizens um, of that building. Um, and I believe there are several other um, um, bills out there we can look at or grants to try to get some more money on the EOC center. So um, that was uh, encouraging to receive some information from them on that. Um, and then again, the other uh, House bills and Senate bills are just proposed. There's nothing that has happened yet. Um, and those of you attending legislative days um, will give you some information in reference to these bills um, that we might support or that we would like for um, our representatives to not support. So we'll give you some general information on that in the future. So, um, And the next item is the construction management. So we have Chet Kramer here to give you an update on the projects. Good 
evening. I have a quick update this afternoon, first of the year. Uh, we'll just look over four different projects. Uh, the first one still being the dumpster enclosure on 5th and Baker. Uh, Public Works and myself, we continue to work with waste management on adjusting the grade. Uh, the as you approach the compactor, uh, we've we've made several uh, patches. Like I say, it is it is a growing, just uh, to getting into getting this operational. So we uh, we actually had another meeting uh, yesterday morning with uh, waste management, and we'll be making another uh, patch to this uh, hopefully later this week, as the schedule allows. That's the last piece on that. Um, once it's proven itself. Uh, to be in operation, the temporary dumpsters will be removed. In the meantime, we have uh, moved them over away from the entrance to the restaurant, so uh, working with the owner there. Next item is just a quick update on the, the pool project, the upcoming pool project. Uh, CPH Engineering is engaged. Uh, they're in the beginning of the design phase now. Uh, we have a scheduled meeting with city staff uh, next week as to what they've uh, come up with uh, the beginning of the design and with the approval of tonight's CMAR we'll uh, be presenting to you in the near future the citywide CMAR which is what will this project will be covered under so um, just a progress update on that uh, as, as far as the Limit Avenue site uh, Public Works and the Utility Department are currently relocating uh, records from the structure on the Lemon Avenue site over to the structure um, near the water tower and that's a climate controlled uh, building which is what these uh, records require so that is the uh, progress uh, of that and the demo uh, will be in the upcoming future. So that's the house that's over on Lemon. And if you recall the little blue white house that's over there that will be demolished. And the last item is uh, for the fire station number 35. As you all know, the, the property was closed on the end of December. Uh, the next steps from the construction standpoint will be the environmental remediation and the demolition of the structure. Uh, those are in process now for approval. And that's all I have if you have any questions. Thank you. And then I think uh, the only other item that we talked about would be at the um, um, first meeting in February. We'll bring back to you uh, some of the projects of the projects that we've discussed over the past few weeks and months um, as to a status because we haven't gone through that status of things that we've been working on, example, the parking garage and a status of that. So um, we were trying to give a few of our uh, contractors and those who are in, in the middle of looking at things this month and I hope to bring that for the February meeting. And that's all I have, ma'am. Our strategic planning session, progress on that. Um, yes, we um, we have uh, Ken Peach as your strategic um, facilitator. Um, we have Lynn Tipton here. We'll, we'll be here to speak in reference to legislative, yes, and council. Um, just generalities of what a council uh, would do. Um, we're scheduled for 8.30 on the 17th um, in the community building. Um, we are scheduled to go till 4.30. Um, that is a full day. You will have your break. Um, I think, Madam Mayor, you've mentioned 11.30 to 1, 1 o'clock or 1.30 1 uh, for lunch, in which uh, encouragement of going to the downtown restaurants and participating down there. Um, and then um, we have a second follow-up uh, scheduled for March 6th. That's a Friday also, um, in which we've scheduled uh, an entire day. The morning, the first part of the morning till noon will be your strategic plan. Um, and then we will follow that up with a budget session so that we can tie the budget into the strategic plan, at least from a parameters perspective, from your uh, seat on what you see happening. Um, but also um, we will bring a specialist in to kind of go over what um, the big picture of budgets should do and what we should see happening and that type of thing. And then the end of the month, we'll have your really first budget meeting. And that, um, that meeting on uh, March 6th, 6th. Of March starts at? Um, 8 o'clock. Yes. A community building, I think, at this point in time also. And we may be able to change okay. that at a further date, but it'll be 8 o'clock either way. Uh, question, Ms. Hayes. 
the uh, retreat is on the 17th. I mistakenly, or I had uh, Arbor Day on the 16th and the 17th. Is that on the 16th? On the 16th. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I believe they changed that date. We had a notice recently at the 16th. Yes. Uh, thank you. That that makes it comfortable. Thank you. Actually, one of the challenges we ran into was trying to find appropriate meeting space for us to be able to really function well. Um, and we talked to a number of different um, areas, but it just didn't work out. So we kind of ended up doing full circle and ending back up at the community building, which we understand it's not the best in as far as the acoustics. Um, but it did it, it. It's what we've got. Um, so it kind of showed that we have an opportunity here in town. We really need some multi-use um, uh, meeting space to where we can comfortably, not just for us, but for our residents, be able to have these type of uh, planning sessions. My intent was, and I had hoped to be in the middle of town, but it didn't work. Um, I really will, would like everyone to go out and enjoy the downtown. That's why I'm planning the two hours for lunch. I hope you get, um, don't go to the place you always go to. I'm going to encourage you to go to the place you might not have been yet because we've had new restaurants open and different things. Um, and there'll probably be even a little fun um, process that we'll do because um, I want part of my thought process, and, and all of us have been through a lot of strategic planning over our years and our different careers, but one of the things that I've always felt helpful is when you're in the middle of what you're planning for and you get a feel for it as you're doing it, it helps you really see where you want to go sometimes. So I'm really trying to open, open that up. So that's why we've done the planning. And we made the decision not to try to do it all in one day because what we all do is get the angst of trying to get things done. That's why we went ahead on the front end and planned a second half day session so that it will be all right for us to leave that meeting not completely done because you really need to mull over a lot of the discussion and what you hear from each other and what we'll hear from other people and the fact that we have two very good uh, uh, individuals coming to help us through this process. Um, so that's that's kind of my thought process as we've been planning this and talking about um, how to go about. So yes, you're going to have two hours for lunch. It'll we'll be in the lobby, I think. Yes, it'll be in lobby, and we will have the Mount Dora Transit Company arranged for. For those of you who really, um, uh, mobility-wise, it would be a little bit more walk than you might want to do. We'll have that um, taken care of also. So uh, we've tried to think of the different, and and we are also planning that should we not have a good Florida weather day, and have it rain like it did what last Saturday all day, we'll then have it catered in. But. Our goal is to be able to have all of us go out and uh, enjoy downtown for the two hours. Not that we don't, but um, in a different perspective, because you'll help, we'll have talked about the town and a lot of things in the morning for a while, and just about municipalities and things like that. So that's part of the background thought process that we're on. And we also hope to um, have the report, or at least a, um, a draft, from um, the coordinator or the facilitator to you within about 30 days. So you have about 15 days to 20 days to review it before you come back in on the 6th so that there's time to, um, to kind of put together your thoughts based on what he recorded because, it, because again, he could have misinterpreted something. So um, we'll have uh, the um, uh, easels out there. We'll, we'll actually write a lot of things on the board, but there will also be a basically our PowerPoint to keep you focused on where we're at in the process. And I, and I have to share with you what a small world it is, and I talk about this all the time, how life cycles. Your facilitator I've known for over 35 years, and I had no idea he was being looked at as the facilitator until I asked Ms. Uh, Hayes who was going to facilitate, and she told me, and I went, oh my God, I hired his wife 35 years ago and I worked for the healthcare system. I've known them for 35 years, uh, and I knew he was doing a lot of consulting work around the state, but um, I didn't know that, so I was excited to, to hear that because I do know he's extremely very good at what he does, and he's very easygoing so that he'll really be able to uh, facilitate and uh, navigate uh, a lot of the challenges we're going to talk about because I think um, we do have some challenges facing us, if nothing else, just listening to the discussion about traffic patterns, and we all know how I feel about parking, so it, it'll be good. But anyway, it's, it's a small, and then Lynn we've known for years, Fantastic yes, so she is too. So I think we've got a really good team, so you've done a very good job, you and your team, putting it together for us. Thank you. Okay, we're down to advisory board appointments. Um, let's see, we got the Parks and Rec, so we have a vacancy for District 4.
and we still do. Troy and I have been working okay. on this, um, but we haven't. Um, okay, that's we haven't fine. Got our person just yet. But okay, we're, we're on it. Okay, and my person, I've not been able to reach because he is dealing with family business for the alternate. So I'm in the same shape as you are at this point. And we also have a vacancy in District One. Yes, I'm. I'm in the same place with. Okay. Person, person so you're, Trail and you. Yeah. So you were still working on that one. Okay. Um, let's see, we have the Library Advisory Board um, and vacant for District 1 also, an alternate. I do have Tiffany Patterson and I have the application for her. Okay, I believe we've got it at our desktop. Yes, you do. I move approval. Okay, I have a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Well, you got 50% of yours done. How's that? Okay, let's see. So we're done there. City Attorney. Yes, ma'am. I uh, just wanted to let you know about uh, we had had a, a federal lawsuit that was filed uh, in August, I think, of last year. Um, we did an order to show cause as to why it shouldn't, or the, the court did an order to show cause as to why it shouldn't be dismissed because of a motion to dismiss that my firm filed. Um, no one ever filed anything, so he didn't really respond. So the insurance company has actually asked that the claim be closed out with the understanding that it could potentially come back. There are um, there's statute of limitations issues. There could be different dates of when the claim arose. Um, but we don't anticipate it coming back. Um, it was related to the police department. We really just don't believe that there were any legitimate issues that were pled in the claim. So it likely will not return, but it has, in fact, gone away. It's as without prejudice, I take it? The dismissal would it, be without? It was with, it did permit the uh, claimant to come That's back fine. and if they chose, but they just haven't. So that was kind of good news. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, so, Miss Burnett. I have notes. Oh, very good. So, I have a question, Miss Hayes, about... Um, Microphone. There we go. There. So, I would like to ask the staff to look at other municipalities about um, of the possibility of an annual day for Mabel Reese Norris. Since this year is designated for this year only, I would like to have the staff look at other municipalities and see what they have as far as policy for annual events named for people. So my suggestion, Council, would be that we would put a discussion item on a future agenda to allow you to discuss whether or not you would like to develop a policy that would allow you to fix parameters by which to assign a day, and then if you wish to bring that back to the Council for consideration after you've established a policy that has no current parameters that we can do so. Um, so we can put that on a February discussion item so that you can do that. Okay, and the second thing I have is, so when I went to Rwanda, and every month they have a cleanup day on the third Saturday, every single month, and they clean up all, the entire country. The president, the ministers, everybody does cleanup. And I'm wondering, so I, I received, um, I'm on the next door list and I noticed that somebody in Sylvan Shores is also cleaning up things. And I wondered, and I know that we have a cleanup day in the Northeast. I'm wondering if we could maybe extend that so it's not just one day uh, during the year, but maybe more. So that's just something we could talk about, maybe, in the discussion period. Sounds good. Put, put that down for discussion. We'll do that. Very good. Thank you. Good idea. That's all for me. Very good. Mr. Rawson. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just to remind uh, Council members, uh, 9 a.m. this coming Monday and every Monday thereafter is the call-in for the legislative uh, session. Uh, you all have or can get the call-in number in the code. Uh, 
And so I would urge us all to participate in that, those that can. Uh, the first one of the year will be this coming Monday, so it will be, uh, I think, uh, pretty important for us to know that. And the value of that is if, if there are some issues that are coming up that are urgent, that's the best way to know if they are, and we can contact legislators uh, or not, as the case might be. Uh, I think it's important also, I'm speaking to the choir, I know that, but for each of us to know that uh, our legislative team is, <coughs> is doing their work, our lobbyist is doing their work, the evidence of the money that has been approved so far is Exhibit A in that, and as our manager said, I believe there's more coming. We knock on wood, we hope. Uh, that's really good dollars for taxpayers, uh, and uh, and I, I've repeated this more than I need to because you all know that. But uh, the best money we've spent in this legis in past legislative council or legislative sessions uh, is that lobbyist group that brings in sometimes millions of dollars for us. That, and if that isn't a good use of taxpayer dollars, is the lobbyist group, I, I don't know what is. Uh, for example, uh, home rule issues are looming, and I'll give you one example. As you know, uh, no city in Florida can prohibit smoking in the public parks, because the legislature has preempted that, of all things. Can you imagine? It's an attack on home rule, of course. Uh, there is a bill now in the Senate that will allow cities to do that and remove that preemption or that exemption, uh, but there's no bill filed in the House yet. Uh, so you need both, and hopefully that's coming up. But watching those things is pretty important. That's just one example of continual attacks on Article 8, Section 2B of the Constitution that gives us the right to do home rule, and every city in Florida have that same right. Um, thirdly, I want to add my, uh, uh, Ms. Burnett and others have said that tonight, uh, my uh, deep appreciation to uh, Gary McKechnie and his team uh, that have done all the work in memorializing uh, Mabel Norris Reese and her work in, Mount, in, her, in her publishing company in Mount Dora and exposing uh, Sheriff McCall for his bigotry and criminal conduct. Uh, and not only does she and should she, and she did, criticize him, uh, but there are two former prosecutors in this, on this dais, and that prosecutor should have gone to jail for, not, for the power that he had and failed to exercise in preventing crimes from occurring uh, and uh, we, we that have done that know the power that prosecuting attorneys have for correcting injustices, and it wasn't done. So uh, she was not only everybody mentioned Sheriff McCall, but I was drawn to this to the information, especially in the, in the uh, I think it was Orlando Sentinel recently that did something. No, oh, excuse me, the uh, Daily Commercial that did something on her. Maybe it was a Sentinel. Both have over time. Yeah, for uh, focusing also on prosecutors and the law, enf law enforcement community in general. So I think that's uh, that's a wonderful thing that's been done, and I I'm honored to support whatever whatever as uh, occurs there to to honor uh, that woman. Uh, and then a reminder, just for what it's worth. Uh, you all know we have, the city owns this little golf course up in the southern end of uh, Highland. And uh, I had a meeting there today with the executive director of the Lake League to do some planning for the, this upcoming meeting. And uh, I would, uh, he has, he has, he's the vendor for the lunch there from, the executive director of the Lake League is the vendor for the lunch there on Wednesdays through Saturdays from 11 to 4. So they have a, a great little lunch program. It's really inexpensive, and uh, because it's one of our facilities, uh, from time to time, uh, I intend to try to have a, a little lunch there and check them out and do do a test drive. So I, I encourage everybody to consider that as well. 
Uh, other than that, uh, I thank you all. Happy New Year to everybody, and uh, I'll, I'll enjoy this next year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I know, uh, Madam Mayor, why we're doing it downtown on the 17th, and I applaud that. But if we run into obstacles, we're getting a location. Uh, as a follow-up, the golf course up there mm -hmm. has a wonderful uh, facility that maybe it would be used, as does a couple of other places in the area, such as Martin Luther King Center, for the new event center out uh, by the post office. So uh, if we hit stumbling blocks downtown, I think any of those would be more than willing to accommodate They, they were all look at, looked at except the golf tournament course because at the time they hadn't fully implemented their program no. for food. But, it's, um, but it is, yes, there are those type of things. But my focus for this one was I want to be oh, no, and I, uh, I agree with that. But yes, yeah, all but of I'm those were on a list, trust me, including yeah. also the um, lawn bowling, too. That was on the list also. Yeah. 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 And the chamber. Yeah, I'm familiar with a couple of those. What happened? Yep. But uh, the golf course is making strides. So uh, I've been up here several times recently, and uh, they are making strides and trying to get some things going up there. Uh, one, if Mr. Salerno is still here, so good. Several weeks ago, if not a month, two, three months back, Mr. Salerno, I believe, brought up the 15 minute parking signs in front of the old postal facility. Uh, hopefully, going forward, maybe the signs can come down so we can park there. It still says 15 minutes. So, again, we looked at leaving some of them for the bank because the bank did ask for some of them to be left. So the ones that are there are the ones the bank asked to be left. Uh, okay. The ones on the front of the street, on the two sides, yes, those were... And one side in front of the bank I can see, but in front of the post office. But they, uh, yeah, a lot of people park there and walk <laughs> across the street. I mean, I, I actually run into that... Um, no. Almost on a daily basis, yes. Okay. So we left them for that reason. All righty, good enough. Uh, <coughs> it was funny that the uh, Mr. Allen and the Madam Mayor again talked about <coughs> letters that they received from uh, that were less than warm and friendly. Uh, I talked to two uh, merchants. They got letters <coughs> regarding uh, basically code violations. And I've heard both of them, and they were not warm and fuzzy. And Nora, I, I know you have to be professional in these, but in both letters it was, fix it now, or you know, face deportation or something is basically the way it <laughs> came across. And I, I just, I looked at it and went, you know, it's a little heavy-handed, um, I thought from the way the letters were presented. Um, the uh, where's an attaboy and there was a uh, New Year's Eve there was a party down around Lake Gertrude mm -hmm. and they did everything right I mean they got talked to the per got the permits got everything did everything right it was cleaned up immaculate it looked better than the day before the party uh, but I talked to one of the organizers and yet, kudos for, and I believe it was Barry. They remember his first name being Barry, but they couldn't tell me the sergeant's last name. He was off duty, he was hired, and they said he was just fantastic. Right. So please, uh, from there, they said, yeah, just did not have enough good words to say about him. So that could be passed on to him. Certainly. I appreciate it. Uh, and this is just kind of a joint thing. It's going to be long range. I know we don't own the highway or anything else up there by Lot 11. That's U.S. Highway 441. But just the traffic's not going to get better. At some point in time, if we can uh, work with the county and whoever else, and maybe it's being done, but it's going to be a long range plan. Uh, something coming out of Lot 11 where there can be an access road down and then a light to cross because I'm watching rush hour up there and there's 8, 10, 12 cars making U-turns at the light and the traffic going the other way and it's it's not going to get better. And this is not, I mean that's, yeah, I, our hands are tied but we just, there I think in many cases there are residents 
who are uh, taking their life in their hands up there, coming out of that uh, shopping center. And just one little Christmas thing, I was able to be up at the Martin Luther King Center for the uh, Christmas party with the kids. I had to leave before the party actually started, but I got there a couple hours early, helped decorate, and I regret not being there to see the kids come in, but it was a ball. It was a blast. I, uh, I really enjoyed just help setting up and doing things like that. It was for a great cause. I'm sorry I couldn't have stayed and seen the kids. They had a great time. They were running around everywhere. Oh, I'm sure of that. I'm sure the noise They enjoyed was, themselves. Yeah, they could have lit a city for all, yep. the, all the power they were putting out. Okay, and that's it. I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crail. I'll pass. Oh, thank you. Oh, Mr. Crail passes. Okay. Chrissy, Ms. Siles. Um, I just wanted, I'm not sure if Ms. Burtnett's comment addressed um, also like the naming of facilities. Can we add that to the discussion? As so there's already a policy for the naming of facilities if you wish to discuss that policy, but there is a policy in place for facility naming. Okay. So is that... Why don't you go ahead and bring it so at least we okay. can be refreshed over it. Okay. okay. I thought we talked about that this morning. Well, yeah, but we have a policy for that, so maybe we were in circles on it, okay. but yes. Okay, and the last thing is just to remind everybody about this Sunday at 3 o'clock in the community building is the um, unveiling of the... Uh, sculptured um, statue of Mabel Norris Reese with the presentation um, with um, Emmy award-winning reporter Bob Keeling is going to be hosting um, and interviewing um, Gilbert King who authored both books um, written about Sheriff w Wills McCall, uh, one of which he won the Pulitzer Prize for. So three o'clock in the community building, um, it should be a really great event and it's totally free. And I believe Mabel Norris Reese's, Reese's granddaughter will be there, which will be really, really interesting. So. The Hope papers started at oh, 2 o'clock, to come at 2 o'clock, didn't it? Did I read that incorrectly? I think it's a great event. But uh, the doors may open at 2 or 2.30, but I believe it starts it. at 3 o'clock. Okay, thank you. This Sunday. Yeah, it's, it's actually 3, and because that afternoon also is the public um, thing for the reception for Dr. Moore at Lake Receptions, and it starts at 1, so I put them down so that you can do both. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, are we done, Ms. Dow? Done. Okay. So, Mr. Massey. I need to share with you all a story. Uh, we live in a community of senior citizens, and I certainly am uh, chief among those. Uh, I, I need to remind everybody, and I need you to tell my story to others, because our community, we live in a strange world. Uh, we all get robocalls and scams and what have you that are fairly easy to recognize, but uh, last week my wife and I were returning from uh, Altamont Springs and pulled into this parking lot at Publix uh, uh, here in Mount Dora as my telephone rang through my Bluetooth in my car, and the caller uh, had a prefix for Maryland, which doesn't compute to me. I don't know anyone in Maryland, but uh, the caller... Uh, said, Grandpa, I need your help. It sounded somewhat like my grandson, but was not quite right. Uh, and I said, what's the problem? And he said, uh, a lady has run a red light and destroyed my car, uh, and I had to go to the hospital. I had seven stitches. It broke my nose. And in my mind, I'm saying, okay, maybe this is the reason why he sounds different. He's emotional, he's frightened, uh, he, he's been injured. Uh, and and uh, I said, what, what's the problem? And my wife is about to climb through the roof of the car, and she said, Harm, is that you? Because she too was having difficulty equating the voice to the circumstance. Um, and I shushed her, but, but the name is out there. The, the caller now knows that we do have a grandson, and he knows the name. Uh, he continues, uh, he said, I've been arrested. The lady told the police that uh, it was my fault, and she's seven months pregnant, and she was injured in the accident, and I'm scared. And he said, I want you to call my attorney. Uh, and he was insistent, I want you to write this down. Uh, 
that's another strange thing. My grandson wouldn't be insistent and he wouldn't say, I want you to call my attorney. My grandson is a high school junior. He's, uh, he's 17. But my wife is climbing the ceiling. Harm's been injured in an accident and he's been arrested. And I'm shushing her. <laughs> and so I get out of business card and I jot down the telephone number and the name that he gives me. And he said, now read that back to me. I want to be sure you got that number. And, and I read it back to him and he said, okay, that's right. Please call him right away. So I hung up the phone, called my daughter to find where grandson was. Couldn't reach the daughter, so there's no help there. I got to do this on my own. And while I'm hanging up the phone from leaving a message for my daughter to call me back right away, my phone rang again. Another Maryland area code. This time, the speaker is different. And he introduces himself as the lawyer, the name that my grandson had given me. Uh, and... Uh, he, he said, uh, I, I need your help. And I said, okay, the first thing I need from you is your bar number. Uh, a bar number. bar number. Your bar number. Attorney. We have up the ante, and there's a long silence on the telephone, and then click. click. <laughs> but I need people to understand that we live in a world today where people will do this to you in a heartbeat. Uh, and... and and I'm worldly. I've traveled. I've done things. I've been a prosecutor. I've been in the law enforcement business. I've, I've done all those things. Now, this was a pretty good scan. Uh, I walked into the Sprint store from the parking lot, and I told them about the episode, and they said, oh, that's nothing. We had a lady in here just recently who had a similar call, but it was an opportunity to make money. And if she could come up with fifteen, with $5,000, then the, the return to her would be 15000 and she actually pointed up the money and received a $15,000 check in return that was bogus. You, you knew that was coming. The next thing from that supposed attorney's conversation was, I need you to send money. He identified himself as a public defender. Public defenders don't ask for money. They're appointed by the state. Uh, so, so the bells are going off with me. My wife is still trying to climb the ceiling. But, uh, but you need to know that there are people out there who will skin you for a dime. Uh, it's a strange world we live in. Use caution. The, I shred everything that has my address on it. I, I, I'm paranoid about things like that. Uh, but, but use caution in the way that you do things. And if things don't feel right to you, trust your judgment. Your instincts are probably correct. And I'm sorry to take your time, but you need to know about that. You need to know that there are things like that that operate out there every day. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, may I add something to that? Sure. My, thank you. I had the same experience, and I've had it three times. Really? Three times uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half. And in my case, um, one that I recall vividly, hi, Grandpa, is the first one. Hi, Grandpa, and it's a woman. And I said, who is this? This is Katie, one of my granddaughter's names. And she said, well, I've broken my arm, and I, some she was injured, and she was going to needed some money, didn't have any money. Well, have you called your dad? <laughs> My son? <laughs> and, and finally, after maybe one more sentence, it dawned on me, it's a con, it's a fraud. And I just went click. Uh, and I can piggyback exactly on what Mr. Massey has said. It happens. And that's just one of a dozens of consumer frauds that are out there routinely and they come from where Nigeria or Biloxi, Mississippi using telephone I in every day I get something from a telephone in New Jersey or someplace so I didn't mean to no. duplicate what you said but I underscore it uh, fully and I've had that ex same experience and um, I don't I don't do anything but get angry about it and then get it end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we had, a, I believe, a great holiday season. We're moving into 2020. I um, want to thank all the staff and everyone who helped make it a success. All the store owners I've talked to had a very <laughs> good year, um, and we're quite pleased. Um, the, we also found some challenges, which we can put on our thing, dealing with traffic with our different events and things, but that's the good thing. Um, the Mount Dora Chamber Gala is on the 23rd. It's the State of the um, 
chamber and sit here and everything. I believe Eustace is going to be a part of it, and we are, and Chavaris is not this year. Anyway, we will have a table. If anybody wants to, please let this month. It's the 23rd. It's at Lake Receptions. And uh, the sheriff is the guest speaker. Sheriff is the guest speaker. Peyton is going to be speaking. Yes. He's always very good and very entertaining. Um, so... Um, I, I will send out the invitation. I think uh, Jessica sent it out to you just before. Yeah, I think meeting. you have it in your thing, but I just wanted to be sure you see it and let them know so they can go ahead and do what they need to do. Right, because we'll buy one table before we go any further than that. And if you're if you're attending and sitting at another table, just tell us that, that you're attending, um, but you will be sitting at a guest table so you don't need your seat, and then we'll proceed to give that seat out. Okay, so, and I'm attending sitting at another table. Um Statusing on where we are with the streaming of the meetings, I, I know we've talked about this multiple times, but it came to my mind again because we had such good dialogue tonight when we did our, our initial non-agenda um, items, so where what happened with all that? So we're Refresh talking, me, since I'm... Sure, on the Facebook... Uh, yeah, so well, still, yeah. Okay. Just so, so that people can actually... Sure. Um, so we still have the ADA requirements that we have to okay. um, show that information and be able to convey it in that form and that message, and we're not at that point and yet. So do we have a time table? Or is, what, um, what, what is the challenges so, to get there? Uh, so obviously we were using Facebook. They actually uh, are, I think they're looking to, in the future, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, YouTube is also doing that. Um, the other one is the Twitter, I think, was doing something. We also have in this year's budget 75000 to change out our system <laughs> to be able to do the okay. same thing. So we have a combination of things that we hope to be able to bring to you. Okay, very good. And that's all I have. So I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. For adjournment.